So John Woolman was a Quaker and he lived from 1720 to 1772. We're learning about the Quakers versus the Puritans and when they first came to America and what they believed. So what's interesting about Quakers is that they talk about this inner light and how one example says that you should withdraw from sources of conflict and distractions and that Quakerism is designed to minimize external distractions which is something very interesting it's like they say about maybe they're talking about meditation in their own way right they feel that life should be conducted in a simple and direct manner and that the internal spiritual world should always take precedence over the external material world that's beautiful he has a very interesting story about how he has grown well when he was alive how he grew one thing that I found interesting about him was how he championed rights for Indians and the poor and that he didn't want to consume any sugar because at that time sugar was produced by slaves so he was against slavery he speaks a lot about love and here's one example about him so this is his journal and here we go it says but in this swift race it pleased God to visit me with sickness so that I doubted of recovering and then did darkness horror and amazement with full force seize me even when my pain and distress of body was very great. I thought it would have been better for me never to have been than to see the day which I now saw. I was filled with confusion and great affliction both of mind and body. I lay bewailed myself. I had not confidence to lift up my cries to God whom I had thus offended, but in a deep sense of my great folly I was humbled before him. And at length that word which is as fire and a hammer broke and dissolved my rebellious heart. What I like about his writing is that he talks a lot about redemption, a lot about how you can, you know, change your actions. You can uh, appeal yourself to God. He sees God as a loving God, a God that loves all people. Very different from the Puritans. So I'm going to make a video about the Puritans and. I bet you they had some good qualities, but man, did they make a lot of mistakes in the way that they would try to convert people to their faith. It's really dark. And he goes on to say how he found inward relief and that he felt a close engagement with God and that God restored his health and that he believes God restored his health so that he could walk humbly before God. So that's a beautiful thing. And then... Very interestingly, he goes on to say, I now most ungratefully turned again to folly, on which account at times I felt sharp reproof, but did not get low enough to cry for help. I was not so hardy as to commit things scandalous, but to exceed in vanity and promote mirth was my chief study. Still, I retained a love and esteem for pious people, and their company brought an awe upon me. That's true. I... I think vanity is so powerful. Pfft. Imagine, okay, listen, vanity in the 1700s family was nothing compared to what we have now. I mean, the vanity of today is extreme. Extreme. We have people who just want to fully, sh not authenticate themselves, manifest their authentic selves, but they want to acquire objects my big thing is conflict diamonds for example you could have i think it was lady gaga who wore this, this it was pretty to look at but if it was made out of glass i would have worn it okay i don't really care if the gems are real but some people do and it was big necklace and it was like millions of dollars and if you think about it you could literally sell that stupid necklace and feed so many kids, you could build some schools, you could pay off some people's medical debts, but no, you spent the money so that you could wear it on the red carpet, so you could have a couple pictures taken, so that people could 
look at it for a few seconds, forget it, and then scroll through their social media feed and totally forget about it. It's bizarre. So him talking about in his journal, Woman, how he struggled with vanity. Wow. Imagine if he lived today, the kind of vanity he'd see. I mean, the first person who is the most vain would be Floyd Mayweather. I I do follow him, but I follow him as a reminder of what I should not do. I know that sounds totally weird, but sometimes you gotta keep a reminder in your life about what you're not supposed to do. What you should do, what you're not supposed to do. And Floyd, for me, yeah, he won all that money. I get it, I get it. I don't ever hear stories about what he donates to charity, but I constantly see stories about how many stupid watches he has. So, here's another one where he talks about his struggle. John Woolman. We're doing John Woolman, the Quaker saint. Uh, I humbly pray to the Lord for his help that I might be delivered from all those vanities which so ensnare me. Thus being brought low, he helped me, and I learned to bear the cross I felt refreshment come from his presence. But not keeping in that strength which gave victory, I lost ground again, and the sense of which greatly affected me, and I sought deserts and lonely places, and there with tears did confess my sins to God and humbly crave of help of him. And I may say with reverence, he was near to me in my troubles, and in those times of humiliation, opened my ear to discipline. That's a beautiful thing, you know. He pleads for help. He's not vain enough and to, to not realize what he's doing and that he needs help. That's a wonderful thing. He also talks a lot about universal love uh, to his fellow creatures and how he understands people more now because of God. And that he understands people and people will understand him if they've gone through the same struggle. So here's another one that he talks about. Like, when you read him, he sounds very peaceful. And the Quakers seem very peaceful, calm, relaxed, communal. This is a different time period, okay? This is a while ago. So understand the context of when he's writing. No iPhones, no computers, none of that stuff. So, there is a harmony in the sound of that voice to which divine love gives utterance, and some appearance of right order in their temper and conduct, whose passions are fully regulated. Yet all these do not fully show forth that inward life to such who have not felt it. But this white stone and new name is rightly to such only who have it. I like it. I really think you should pick up one of his books and check it out. Forget even if you're a different religion. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It's just about taking in information and taking in new information that's going to upgrade your brain, expand your neural cells, and change your perspective a little bit in a good way. Here's now, okay. Catholics would not agree with this Quaker, Quaker, Quaker view. But listen, he says. All faithful people are not called to the public ministry, but whoever are, are called to minister of that which they have tested and handled spiritually. So he believes that in order to be a minister, you don't necessarily have to get a degree in theology. You, if compelled, can have the approval of your community to be an elder or a minister and the people who understand where you're coming from will approve of you. And you should do your teaching that way. Now, I do get that the counter side to that, maybe what a Catholic would say, is that, well, then you're going to have people misinterpreting stuff. And then we're, when we're, where are we going to be when someone's creating their own rules for the faith? And then we're all going to be fighting with each other even more and more. But what I'd say to that is... Protestants, Lutherans, Calvinists, Presbyterians, y'all already fight, so don't give me that, you know? Here's another one. He's talking about a slave. 
I was so afflicted in my mind that I said before my master and the friend that I believe slave keeping to be a practice inconsistent with the Christian religion. Now at this time, slavery is big family. We have plantations, horrific abuse of slaves. They are literally considered nothing. They are sex slaves. They are forced labor. It is a horrific time period. And for many, the Christian religion has rules on how you should treat your slave. And they use, they got drunk on their own power and slave masters, plantation people. Wow, in the South, that's just a dark history of the United States. And I'm glad that, you know, John at this time had the huevos, the cojones, to say, hey, you need to stop that. Because at this time, that was radical. That was a radical idea. Now, we like to pretend today in 2019 that slavery doesn't exist, but actually it does. And it does in the form of sweatshops. And don't give me this, oh, well, they get paid 50 cents, therefore they are not slaves. No, they're economic wage slaves. And I'm trying to do my best to, for example, he boycotted products. I can't boycott sugar. I like sugar a lot. Um, that'd be very, very hard to give up. But what I can do at least in some areas, is walk where I want to go to use less oil and gas. I can keep my lights off and use candles instead. I make candles so I can just make my own candles. I can unplug uh, appliances. Now I've seen how there's been some cases where you plug in something and it does use power even if it's not turned on, so I've been unplugging things. I got rid of my microwave. Uh, I'm trying to just use my oven or uh, eat fresher foods that don't have to be heated all the time. I do use my stove, uh, my, stuff like that. So I'm trying to, and my shoes, I did buy a couple handmade shoes uh, at the fair by an Asian woman and I'm trying to slowly buy handmade clothes even if they're not as fancy. Uh, so that I can support uh, local artists and craftsmen and seamstresses. So we'll see how that goes. But I f read more up on, on Woolman. He seems very, very unique. We don't hear a lot about uh, the Quakers anymore. Mm, usually you'll hear about them in a history class of the United States from the 1400s to the 1800s or from the 1600s to the 1800s, depending on how your school will break up uh, the history of America. Uh, so yes, okay family.